So tonight we have the privilege of starting off our Women That Slay series. We're going straight into May, which is Female Founder Month. We're going all female founders from here until then. So we are going to kill it with our, with our founder lineup. But tonight we have Kate Edwards, the COO and co-founder of Heartbeat. Heartbeat is changing the influencer market um, by re redefining what true influence is, um, not the Kardashians. She's basically disrupting the Kardashian space, um, which, which I'm all for. Can I give a shout out for that? Right? You love that? So I'm excited for her to share her journey. I'm so grateful for her coming here to speak with all of us and share it. So please give a startup grind welcome, stand up, hoot haw, get crazy for Kate Edwards of Heartbeat. Thanks. So if anything, I hope you felt welcomed there. I do. That was so nice. Can we do that for me every morning? That would be great. Thanks. <laughs> that would be incredible if you can get your entire team to do that for you. Yeah. In fact, when, when the video is done, I'll send it to you. You can show them what the expectations are. Okay, cool. I'll just so, replay it every morning. Perfect. <laughs> so part of what we like to do here is we like to get the, the beginning stories of our founders and entrepreneurs so that we can have that at least that initial point of relatability, right? You know, regardless of whatever successes there are now, we all started somewhere. And so can you kind of share a little bit about your origin story? Where'd you grow up, your upbringing, were you raised by entrepreneurs, uh, your schooling, things like that? Yeah. Um, I'm originally from Virginia, outside Washington, D.C. I grew up on an old Victorian farmhouse with chickens, um, but really close to D.C., so in an urban area. Um, I am a twin, so I think having a twin really plays a lot into a lot of the decisions that I make. So my parents were actually not entrepreneurs, um, although when I was growing up, my dad, my dad was on and off an entrepreneur, I'd say. He, um, he ran a company selling hot tubs, jacuzzis. Um, he had a painting company for a while, but um, never really like had a startup in that true sense. Um, and then my grandfather was an entrepreneur. Um, so, And by entrepreneur, I mean he had a lot of crazy ideas that he sunk a lot of money into. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but didn't really come, you know, most of everybody in my family had more traditional backgrounds. Um, I, you know, after growing up there, I went to Brown for undergrad where I studied international relations, which I never use. Um, and, uh, then I moved to New York. And I worked in advertising for big advertising agencies like uh, J. Walter Thompson, which is what Mad Men is based on, oldest advertising agency in the world. Um, and then I worked for Publicis, which is another huge agency um, for my client was Procter & Gamble. So like this massive marketing organization, this massive CPG company that, that really taught me a lot about what good marketing is. Um, and I ran some of the advertising accounts for, uh, for Bounty Paper Towel. So that was very glamorous. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was it was a really cool experience. Why did you leave the you know the Fortune 50 ad agency? Yeah, um, I I actually loved my team. I had a really cool team of, of people that I worked with, and um, advertising is really fun. You know, I'm sure you guys all know. Um, but I sort of felt like I was solving the same problems over and over again. I think, especially working for those like big CPG brands, you're like, oh, I've done this one. I've launched a new product at Target. I've, you know, I've kind of accomplished these things. And so I left my ad agency. Um, you know, kind of not necessarily knowing what I wanted to do next, but I came to LA to go to business school at UCLA. So I went to Anderson for business school um, to sort of try to figure that out. And I knew I wanted to work in tech. Um, I had this really cool experience in advertising where um, I started I started in advertising in 2007, so it was pre-recession, um, and then the recession happened and everybody above me got fired. <laughs> so I became kind of like this digital marketing expert when no one else wanted to do that. Um, and so I'd really come up in kind of like the, you know, that age of digital marketing and advertising, and, and I knew that's where I wanted to be. So from UCLA, where did that journey take? Knowing that you wanted to do that, what I mean, because really, when, I mean, once you go to UCLA, there's not a whole lot of opportunity, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean can, I, can I get a fight on for my Trojan fans out there? All right. <laughs> so, so here's the thing about going to grad school at UCLA. Like, I don't really care that much. <laughs> uh, you heard it. That's on video. You heard it. 
<laughs> no, I, lo- I love Anderson. Um, so when I was in business school, I actually, I did my MBA internship at Facebook. So I was up in Menlo Park um, working with uh, some incredibly smart people at Facebook um, on their vertical marketing team. Um, awesome experience. I realized then and there, I did not want to work for a big company. And by that time, Facebook was five, 6,000 people. Um, and I felt like I was going in every day, getting free breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It was great. I loved it. But I was kind of doing the same thing over and over again. So I knew I wanted to go into startups. Um, I Instead of going back to work at Facebook, um, I did this crazy, crazy thing, which was go take a job as a professional matchmaker at a matchmaking startup called Three Day Roll here in Los Angeles. Why? That's what he's gonna ask. <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying to help me. Under- so you you graduated Brown. You went to an ad agency that served Fortune 50 companies. So you you serviced major companies. Then you went to UCLA and you worked for a major company. Um, you know, at at Facebook, and you knew you didn't want that. But to to make that leap to a startup, like did. You know, you said your grandfather was an entrepreneur and a hustler, and I mean, so did you fully understand what that meant to work for a startup at that time, or no? I mean, <laughs> I just knew I didn't want to be a cog in the wheel, right? And I think that's very, that's something that I hear echoed in a lot of the millennials and and now Gen Z uh, people that I work with at my company. It's just people say, I want something more. You know, I don't, I'm not just totally satisfied by you know, free organic smoothies every morning. It needs to be, although I do miss that, but, but you know, it needs to be something a little more fulfilling. Um, my job to join a startup was actually really driven by the founder. Um, so the story of me joining three day role is actually kind of a funny one. Three day role is a matchmaking startup. Um, founded by Talia Goldstein, who's another kind of, you know, she's a well-known founder in LA. Um, and she, she basically like started this company. It was, you know, they just got funding. Um, and my career counselor at Anderson was like, Hey, I heard about this company. Ha ha ha. It's your dream job. Cause I was always setting up my career counselor. And I was like, wait a minute. I think that is my dream job. And so I met with Talia, who is the founder and she basically offered me a job on the spot and kind of the rest is history. So I, I took something that had been a core competency of mine, which was like connecting people and setting people up for fun. And I saw that, you know, in a startup that I was really excited about with a female founder that I was really excited about. Um, so yeah, I kind of jumped off a cliff a little bit there, but it was it was the coolest decision I've ever made. So Three Day Rule was your first startup then? It, yeah, it was. And where was the company when you entered it? So when I started it, so they'd been through a couple different... Uh, I won't say pivots, I'll say adjustments. <laughs> um, but it started more of like as like a dating service, like an app company essentially. Um, and then like an online dating site. Um, and then they basically decided that they wanted to be a matchmaking company based in tech. So taking the same tech as like, you know, match.com and okay, Cupid algorithms and then levering, like leveraging that to layer on a in-person human level. Um, and so when I was there, there's just a couple employees. So I was one of the original employees after that decision that they made. Um, and so it was me and another woman who is a matchmaker and now they have 55 matchmakers. So I was there kind of in the beginning when, when that whole process was starting. So, so they're still in, around. They are still around. They're doing really well. Um, they got funding from Match IAC. Um, and yeah, they're, I think, in 11 cities or something. So I was there when we started launching those cities. If you think about kind of like the way that Uber launched or Lyft launched, matchmaking has a similar process. You have to build up that network of, of supply and demand. So, What was that, being that that was your first startup, what was that experience like for you? I had kind of an interesting early startup experience because it was, um, there's a, female CEO and it was almost all women in the company. It was all women except for for one guy. Um, and so I think I had this very unique experience where I got to be very supported um, and everybody worked really hard and no one complained and it was very rare. <laughs> um, so, but it gave me a really great initial experience into the startup world and I just, I was surrounded by really smart, intelligent women. So I think, I think that that was really what drew me to it. 
was um, were you responsible for any pitching at that time? Because you were uh, technically a co-founder, right? I was not a co-founder oh, okay. of Three Day World, but um, yeah. So I was a matchmaker, and then business development, partnerships, my role started to take on a little bit of everything. I was like the MBA in the room <laughs> um, as well. So, but yeah, I, I did end up helping them raise their Series A. Um, so um, Talia, who's the CEO, was, um, well, she was actually fundraising and she was pregnant and there's just a lot going on. And so, you know, I was there to kind of um, be the other person in the room for that round of funding. Okay. Um, and what drove your departure from... A three day rule into whatever the next venture was. I left three day rule because I wanted to go do my own thing. And I had, you know, there, I have an incredible relationship uh, with that company and, and still help them with, with some stuff. And they are, you know, incredible mentors to me. Um, but I left because I realized that there was other opportunities out there and that I saw in myself the ability to be a founder. Um, and so I st- I eventually, I started working on a project on the side, um, which was another dating related company called Textbird, which was a texting advice app for dating. So that idea came from the fact that all of my friends and all of my clients would send me a screenshot of a conversation that they were having with somebody on a dating app. So they'd say, hey, Kate, what do I say back? Like, what do I say back became this thing. Like, I just get a screenshot text, you know, conversation between two people what do I say? And I was like, oh, this is getting annoying for me to do it. I would like, I would be getting like six to 10 of these texts a day. And I was like, I just can't be this person in my group of friends anymore who gives texting advice. So I was like, I can create an app for that. Um, so I did. So I started doing it on the side and then eventually um, went part time and left my, and then left my job full time at three day rule to, to start that company with their support. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's how TechSpirt got started. Now looking back all those screenshots, I feel like that would be an equally popular Instagram account, like overheard LA or whatever. Like, what do I say? Like, just, and people just caption yeah. the response. It's okay. Well, text, so good. text from my ex is a good one to follow. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, it is, it's a, it was a really cool idea, right? Um, one thing I learned is a really cool idea doesn't always make a great business. <laughs> but, um, so let's, but unpa- yeah. let's unpack that a bit. I mean, what were some of the learnings? So obviously, I'm assuming TechSpert is not around anymore. So technically, TechSpert is still around. Okay. All right. So um, then let's unpack that comment about <laughs> not all great ideas make great businesses. So what were some of the learnings uh, for you in that? Yeah. Um, in terms of business, right? I mean, at the end of the day, the goal of any business is to make money. It's one of those things that you say it out loud and you think, you know, well, that's obvious. But when you're in a startup, when you get excited about an idea, that's not always the case. And I think in the current ecosystem where, you know, you don't always have to have a clear path to monetization to raise money, um, you know, it, it's something that's not always apparent uh, to people in the space. So, um I knew I had a really powerful idea because I really I had you know people validating this idea, but I didn't know how I was going to make money doing it. I didn't know what the appetite to for those people to pay was, um, and so that was kind of the first learning was okay. You need to validate people's willingness to pay before you understand if it's a good idea or if it's a bad idea. Um, understanding like what is that product market fit, right? You might have a great product, but you don't have that ability to pay. Um, so I'd say that was one learning. And then the second learning, um, I'd say was, uh, choose your co-founders wisely. (laughs) Um, I, I ended up having, um, kind of a a tumultuous tough break from, from my co-founders at Techspert. Um, and a lot of lessons were learned there in terms of how do you actually start a company? How do you get all the right paperwork in place? You know, how do you make sure that, that you as a founder are protected and, and the work that you're doing, you know, is recognized. So, I mean, how did how did you and your co-founder meet? I mean, because it sounds like it was a little bit of the Wild West where you didn't have proper documentation in place and um, some learn. So how did you guys meet to start this venture? Uh, we met on a dating app. <laughs> awesome. Although I have heard a lot of uh, successful stories of, of founders meeting on dating apps. And now uh, Bumble, which is a dating app, uh, has a, a tool called Bumble Biz where people can meet potential co-founders, which is really cool. So I don't want to discourage that. Um, but my co-founder and I had met kind of um, 
you know, in that, in that way. Um, and he had actually said to me, like, I have this kind of like idea, it's this hunch, like, and I was like, Oh my God, this is great. We have to do this. This is something that I'm seeing in my, in my life as a matchmaker. Like we have to go build this. Um, and then we found a CTO who was great, um, and ended up building it for us. Um, so proper documentation, getting things set up. Um, it sounds like you didn't know your co-founder too well. Uh, so no. <laughs> how as as you have those tough conversations, right? Whether it be equity distribution or whatever the the formal docs are, what happened in that situation? Because you're obviously you're not there anymore. So what happened in that that split? Yeah. So um, you know we had very clearly laid out kind of in writing, but not you know, with lawyers per se, right? I think one of the biggest things that I hear and that I am guilty of is that when you start a company, you're like, oh, I'm poor. I don't have any money for lawyers. Like, trust me, spend the money on the lawyers. Um, so we had kind of like written out documents and signed them ourselves, right? Um, saying this is the number of hours a week we're going to spend on this because I had a full-time job at the time. I had I was working in, in, in an industry that was very similar, you know, basically in the same industry. So we had laid that out. Um, and this is, you know, our equity split. We, we laid all that out, just not with lawyers. Um, and I worked nights and weekends for six to eight months, uh, doing that before I quit my job full time to work on it. Um, and I didn't have in writing, like, if I quit my job, this will happen and this will be the effect. Um, and essentially, long story short, my co founder, um, you know, got frustrated that I was doing side consulting projects and working on other things at the time, which I needed to pay my rent because I don't have parents to pay my rent. <laughs> um, and, you know, he said like, oh, I don't think your heart's in it. And um, he basically said a lot of very uh, negative misogynistic things to me that ultimately led me to leave that business. So, without the details, can we <laughs> unpack the misogyny for a bit? Yeah. So, the, re the re and the reason I want to do this, and the reason I want to do this is, um, as a male, I think we are blind uh, to truly the how challenging it can be to be a female founder, right? I mean, um, and this last week at the global event, one of there was there was a few significant sessions that were centered around the challenges of a female founder um, or a, um, a non-white founder, right? And one of the things that struck me and it really just like hit me over the head was one of the stories of a female founder um, hiding her pregnancy while she's pitching, like for as long as she could. And I thought that is crazy to me at 2018, that's where we are. One of the other things that that just hit me over the head was a VC firm. Um, they did a study of past funded um, uh, companies in their portfolio. They had 17% female founder companies that were funded. That's great because the average overall is 2%. So, so listen to this. So 17%. Then they did this blind um, uh, funding application process where... It, the application was blind. Um, you had no idea about really the team other than the resume. Um, and at the end of it, they they funded you know however many companies they funded, but forty two percent were female founders because it was blind, right? And and when I heard that, and knowing that we're going into this woman that slay series, like I want to just jump into that Let's full it. tilt because <laughs> it is crazy to me. It is crazy. I mean, so so in whatever year that this you know this experience with Techspert was, um, you know the things that we're naive to as as males, um, you know what, I'm not I'm not gonna put all males in the bucket. I'm gonna put me the things that I'm naive to with that. You know what are some of these challenges as a female founder? We got female founders in this room that are probably experiencing it that I don't even know the story. And for that, I want to apologize. You can tell me your story, and we will make sure that we get some stuff out on that. You know, so um, so I mean, let's let's share that. What are the challenges that you've experienced up through Textbird, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I have a lot of stories. Um, one thing I will say, not to be super depressing, is that I have seen an incredible amount of progress in the past three years. Um, even since I've been in this space, you know, I'd say, especially in the past 
year, um, I, I can see a noticeable change in how people are interacting with female founders. So that's great news. <laughs> um, but you know, prior to that, um, so at three day rule, I, I did help raise some, some money with them. Um, you know, I wasn't a founder, but I was in the room and, you know, I, I witnessed the CEO really struggle because she was fundraising while pregnant. Um, and we actually ended up writing an article that was in, Forbes and an article I think that was in Fortune about that experience. So definitely check that out. Um, but you know, we'd walk into a room and she'd be pregnant, and and VCs would say something like, "So who's going to run the company when you have the baby?" And they'd say they'd look at us as two women and say, "So who does finance for the company?" And we'd say, "We do." You know, so things like that that I think are questions that are not asked to male founders. Um, and it was something that we almost became used to, which is really sad, right? Um, and, you know, we tried not to approach it with a chip on our shoulder. We tried to really kind of understand, uh, okay, like, so this is the scenario. How do we present ourselves in the best light given this situation, which is always a tough, a tough thing to be in. Um, and then with Techspert, you know, as a founder, I had left my full-time job and devoted, you know, a full-time job basically to this, plus working on other projects to pay my bills. Um, and the way that that my relationship with my Techspert co-founder ended was he basically said to me like, Hey, like, I know your heart's not in this when it very much was, I know your heart's not in this. You know, I know you want to do other things with your life. Like go have babies. Um, and as soon as those words were said to me, I just knew I could never work with this man ever again or respect his, you know, him as a founder or somebody I'd be working with. Um, and, and so for me, that type of, of language is something that, at some point in my career, I had to put my foot down and say, I can't work with people like this. And it was really unfortunate because I walked away from a company that I started and helped build. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, it was a, it was, that was a tough decision. Does that play into um, your current endeavor and with Heartbeat? Does that play into the, the firms you go to pitch to? Does, is there, is the, does that always stay present in your mind on the current state of 17% female founder funding or that, that, that comment about um, your other co-founder being pregnant. I mean, does that stuff stay there? So when you go to firms, you're constantly thinking like, this one is probably not female friendly. Yeah. So I have a, a male co-founder at, at Heartbeat. So it's been kind of a night and day experience, honestly. Um, and if it, it's interesting because I do feel like uh, some people, some people care that there's a female founder. Some people don't care at all. Um, but we always get the time of day. We always get, um, the meeting at the time we want. And that didn't happen when it was just women. Um, so it, it is like a different feeling. Um, and you know, but, but it, I also have changed, right? Like I've also learned and adapted the way that I do business. When I first started out, um, I used to take meeting with VCs and they'd say, let's get dinner. And I wouldn't know if it was dinner for me to pitch them my company or if it was dinner as a date. And there was a really blurry line. And so now I would never do that. First of all, I'm, I'm older and <laughs> it comes up less often, to be honest. Um, <laughs> but, but they, you know, I only do breakfast meetings. I would not take a dinner meeting with the VC, for instance. So I've changed how I behave. Um, and I think that the VCs also are very aware of, of these issues as well. So they're, they may or may not be on better behavior. Uh, do you, um, with other female founders, is this a topic of conversation or is it something that, um, is, stated but never addressed like i mean where, where is this at with other female founders that you you network with and maybe mentor or mentored from yeah i'm really lucky to have a very strong powerful network of female founder friends um i think when i started even heartbeat a few years ago in la there were just not as many female founders and now there's you know 50 or 60 that i can think of off the top of my head so really exciting um i would say there's kind of it, there is kind of an offender list um, uh, of the VCs, especially in LA. Um, it's a very small community in tech. So if somebody, you know, has a reputation for, you know, kind of making a move on somebody, like we all know that. Um, and if somebody has a reputation for, like, there's a couple of people I can think of that, like, say they invest in female founders and, like, talk about it but never do so that's talked about a lot kind of the people who never really you know put their money where their mouth goes yeah um you know one of our sponsors is the scb edc and they're you know quasi attached to the to the city 
And I think, you know, and the idea of trying to make, you know, monumental change, is this something that you think, you know, cities can participate in? I mean, how can, how can we as a community help drive, you know, change in this regard, right? I mean, is there, is there anything or is it strictly once the VCs change, then everything else changes? I, I do think cities can help. I think cities play a really important role in this. Um, and I, I think, you know, obviously Santa Clarita is doing a huge amount to, to invest in the community and the startup community. And that's so exciting. Um, I think LA has started to put a lot more money into tech as well, but they're just starting to get into tech, right? Like they're just getting there and then they need to get to like, oh, okay, female founders are a thing too. Um, but yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of work to be done. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not somebody who's super, super involved in, in kind of like city government, but I, um, I think it, it really is just about, you know, supporting the right types of organizations that support women and things like that. Awesome. So, um, let's jump into heartbeat now. So thank you. Thank you for being candid in all sure. of that. I appreciate that. Uh, so let's jump into heartbeat. So Textbert. You left Textbert. I left Textbert, and then I started consulting for a bunch of different startups all around Los Angeles. So I work for a travel company, and I work for a health and wellness company. Um, and my consulting ranged from helping with fundraising to helping with kind of business strategy and monetization to helping with marketing, which is my original background. Um, one of the things about working in startups is you start picking up these skills, <laughs> and then other companies start asking you if if you can help them with those skills. So I had a, a very thriving kind of consulting business very soon uh, after I left. So heartbeat. Let's jump into heartbeat. We're, yeah. we're going straight into heartbeat. Yeah. We're going to skip all the other stuff. We're going to straight into heartbeat. Yeah, well, that's um, an interesting one. So <laughs> I, I, I said, you know, heartbeat is disrupting the Kardashian market. Obviously, <laughs> that's probably not the exact phrase, but you're free to use it if you want. Um, what Explain explain to people what heartbeat is. Sure. Um so I'll, I'll start with the origin story because it's actually, it's pretty relevant. So long, you know, basically Heartbeat in a nutshell, we are a marketing platform that connects brands directly to the female consumers that they want to reach and activates those women um, as brand loyalists by having them post on their personal social media accounts. Um, but we started Heartbeat. So my, my current co-founder, whose name is Brian Freeman, um, he, he and I met because he was also working in the tech dating space. So he, I know, is like... You were heavily involved in the dating space. I was heavily involved. Um, but it's a small community. Tinder, Bumble. Um, there's really just not that many people that work in this industry. So we all knew each other. Um, and so he had an app called Wildfire, which I had on my phone before I met him. Uh, you know, we all, we all knew each other. Um, and he came to me and he said, you know, we have, uh, I think it was like a thousand ambassadors for his app. And he said... We launched this dating app by going to college campuses. So we went to USC and UCLA and UC San Diego. And he got women in sororities to put the app on their phone and then post about the app on their social media account. And he said, you know, this is this marketing channel is outperforming all of the other marketing channels. It's outperforming Facebook ads. It's outperforming working with influencers. Like, I think there's something here. And my marketing background was like, oh my God, wait, what? What is this? And so I got really excited and I was like, so what you're saying to me is you think that normal women are more powerful than influencers and celebrities. And he was like, yeah, what if that's true? And I was like, what if that's true? So um, so we started testing it. Um, and we started saying, you know, and this is like how I learned my lesson. We started reaching out to potential clients and say, is this something you would pay for? <laughs> like, would you get a community of women who are genuinely excited about your product, like, would you want them posting about you on social media? And everybody we talked to said yes. Everybody wants like this ambassador community of people who are super pumped about their product. Everybody wants people talking about them on social media. Um, and so we knew from the beginning that we had something there um, in terms of our ability to make money. Um, what I don't think we understood at the time was that all millennial and Gen Z women are really excited about working with brands. So um, it's kind of foreign to people who are not millennials to think that like it's actually very aspirational to work with brands. Um, but but that has been really the power and magic of the community. So we started with you know a couple hundred ambassadors, and now we have 175,000 female brand ambassadors posting for products on on Instagram for us. 
That's awesome. Is the is the 175 um, concentrated in certain territories? Are you only in certain markets, or we're mostly U.S. Okay. Although we have strange contingents in like Romania and Brazil, <laughs> um, but mostly U.S. Um, major metropolitan cities, and we do have a lot of kind of Middle America as well. Um, but our segments are like college students, young moms, young professionals who you know, like your dental hygienist is probably on her feet. Um, but the, the important thing to note is we don't work with any bloggers. We don't work with the Kardashians. We don't work with the people that you follow on Instagram. We work with your friends. So every woman in this room could be a Heartbeat ambassador. And Heartbeat is kind of the first company to c- come to you and say like, hey, your voice really matters. Like your opinion is just as valuable as everybody else is out there, no matter what you look like, no matter what shape you are, no matter what size you are. Um, and it's actually been really, really transformative for the brands that we've been working with. Because I don't want to forget this. What is the what is the follower count or what is the ideal, you know, uh, Instagram size for the people you look for as an ambassador? Is it like a, a thousand to five thousand? Is it yeah, our, 50? our sweet spot is people who have between five hundred and five thousand followers. So if, if you have more than ten thousand followers on Instagram, you're trying really hard <laughs> right like that is your thing like you're trying to be an influencer you're trying to get out there um, but anybody who has around you know fewer than 5,000 followers really is just a normal person posting about their life posting about things that they're excited about um, and it's that authenticity that actual real consumer who's you know that's the ideal person for us and so I don't want to forget how can for those who do want to sign up as an ambassador how can they do that real quick oh you go to getheartbeat.co Get heartbeat.co. Perfect. Yeah. Females ambassadors only, correct? We are doing some campaigns with men right now. Oh, you are? So <laughs> oh, okay. Um, we our company is all about female empowerment, but sometimes brands will be like, you know, the other thing like the other thing what's really interesting about Heartbeat is like we actually don't care that much about gender, like because what we found is there actually is a good amount of like gender fluidity um, in the people we work with, whether or not you identify as a woman or identify as a man or identify as something else. Like we are, we are open to working with you, and we want to put, you know, explain that you're valuable to the brands that we're working with too. Do the brands pick the ambassadors? The brands don't pick the ambassadors. So Heartbeat is a tech company. Okay. Um, we have an awesome CTO whose name is John Hall. He was the co-founder of Tradesy, which is another big LA startup. Um, so he's built some incredible tech that identifies the best ambassadors for that campaign. So when an ambassador signs up, they're evaluated. They sign up using their Instagram. Um, they sign up using their Facebook. And they answer all of these survey questions. We know over 400 data points of each on each one of them when they sign up. Um, and so we are able to segment them and target the right ambassadors. And then our technology uses an algorithm to um, identify the top performers based on engagement rate and how often they're posting and, and all that good stuff. So Awesome. All right. So now that we've kind of set up a little bit about what Heartbeat is, um, you met uh, Brian Freeman um, mm-hmm. through Wildfire. And, you know, Tell us a little about the Google Sheets in a Dream uh, origin <laughs> as, of Heartbeat. Let's kind of talk about you know that, get to Techstars, your funding road, what that's been like. Yeah. Um, so as we talked about, we're very much still a startup. <laughs> um, we feel very lucky to have come as far as we have, but we're definitely still in, in startup mode. Um, so we started the company about two years ago. Um, and I described the beginning origins of the company as Google Sheets in a Dream uh, because that's what every startup is. When when you begin it, you're like, I have this idea. And then somehow you have all these like Google and Excel docs and you're like this is a company. I don't know. Like I, I have no idea where we are. Um, and so we really started with this like hypothesis that like, okay, cool. Like normal people, like 500 followers is better than 500,000 followers, which was like very, you know, antithetical to the, to the common sense in marketing at the time. Um, and so when we started, like, we experienced a little bit of skepticism, um, but we, you know, we were just scrappy. We worked out of this old beat up house. We call it the murder house, <laughs> which is a story I'll tell you another time. <laughs> um, but you know, like the toilet exploded into the backyard and like we have like the best early startup house stories. But um, so, you know, we were really scrappy. We were working with nothing. Um, we, 
we basically had raised a tiny bit of money um, and used that to, to keep going. Um, and we were actually, you know, making money, which was cool. Um, with Google Sheets. With Google Sheets. Awesome. Um, so we brought on John, our CTO, and he actually formalized everything into real technology. And we're like, this is amazing. Um, and that was, that was in June of 2016. 2015, 2016. And um, he was like, okay, you guys need to be a real company. Let me build you some tech. Um, and then in November, we actually landed a deal with Amazon. And Amazon said, we want you to do a campaign where you have 7,000 millennial moms posting on Instagram. And we did a little research and we realized that's the biggest Instagram campaign that's ever been done. Sure, we'll take it. <laughs> um, so, you know, we were like, okay, now we're a real company, right? Like, we have to do this. Um, and we probably had 30,000 ambassadors at that time. And by the end of the campaign, we had acquired so many to do the campaign. I think we had 60,000 at the end of that campaign. Um, but it was, it was crazy. It, it took us about three weeks or a month to, to execute this. We ended up actually having 10,000 people posting instead of 7,000. Um, and Amazon was super happy with the campaign. So, you know, we had this kind of huge uh, moment in the company where we said, like, can we do this? Are we going to be a real company? And then we did it. And then we knew then and there that not only was it a huge idea that brands were excited about, it was something that, that we were capable of. Um, and that was a big moment for us. That's awesome. That's awesome. Amazon, the first big one. It was, it was the big one. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I love that. Yep. So that was um, fall of 2016, you said. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and when did Techstars come in? Because now, I mean, you have a business now. You have a CTO who's building tech. Yep. Um, you, ha you are at revenue, mm -hmm. right? You've raised a little bit of money. Um, I assume you were pitching during that time, regardless. We were, yeah. So how did, um, how did Techstars come in to be and why Techstars? So, um, so we had about another six months between that moment and Techstars, and um, we were doing really well. We were increasing, we had really strong, you know, revenue growth during that time. We were hiring people. Um, you know, we were we were doing really well. Um, and then we had this idea, like I can't even remember how it came up, like, oh, Techstars applications are coming out. And Techstars, for those of you who don't know, is an accelerator program. It's, you know, one of the biggest ones out there. Um, and to be honest, when I heard this idea, I was initially really skeptical. And part of it was I had just like gotten recently, a few years ago, gotten my MBA. I was like, we're doing really well. Like, we don't need this. You know, like, we know what we're doing. Like, you know, like, when you're a founder, you have, have to have like a healthy sense of cockiness. <laughs> so I was like, no, we don't need this. Um, and, but somehow I still did the application and we made it to the next round. We made it to the next round. Um, and this whole process took a while. So we probably started the application process in January, you know, got a first round interview in February, got a second round interview in, in March, um, and ended up getting in, in April, I want to say. Um, and it was a big decision. So we would we were the farthest along company in Techstars. We had ten people going into Techstars. Most of the companies had two people, and were just ideas. And we had a functioning business. Um, but it was honestly the best decision we could have made for the business. Um, it was really transformative for us in that you know we were going full speed ahead on our product um but we were going full speed ahead in the wrong direction right and so we needed somebody to tell us that and techstars just provides all of this mentorship it's like you meet with 75 mentors in two weeks and everybody tells you everything you're doing wrong um and uh you know just just really incredible coaching as well um so they kind of take you as a founder and and, and build you into something that that's even stronger so it was great how how i mean that's that's an interesting point right i mean you have 75 meetings in a two week period, I think you said. And, and, you know, to your point, I mean, as a founder, it's your baby. You think you know best, right? And you have to have that. You have to be a learner while at the same time committed to what it is you're building. How do you, how do you balance that, especially when you have 75 people poking holes at? And within a concentrated space, right? It's different 75 people over four years, 75 people over a two week period of time. I mean, what was that process like? And were you just open minded the entire time? Or did the, was it like you were on guard for the first couple of times and then finally you're like, okay, maybe there's something to be said here? Yeah, I, on guard is a good way to describe it. Um, I think most founders are, are sellers. You know, you mentioned the, the, 
you have to be a learner. Most founders are not learners, right? Because they have this idea and they're constantly going towards that goal. Um, so combining the idea of being a constant seller, a pitcher, somebody who's delivering an idea nonstop to somebody who's going to be a learner is that's a huge ch- jump. And it took us a while to figure it out. Um, one of the parts that I've conveniently left out of the story of Heartbeat is that we started with three co-founders. Um, and during Techstars, we ended up uh, losing one um, and uh, is no longer part of the company. So, you know, it, it was very transformative for us in terms of how do people deal with change? How do people deal with the evolution of a startup going from a tiny Google Sheets and a dream idea to something bigger? Um, and what you realize is not everybody has the, the capacity or the, or the energy to, to make that happen. Did the business model of Heartbeat change pre-Techstars to post-Techstars? Uh, it, it definitely adjusted. So we're still selling the same product and that we're you know, basically allowing brands to, to connect directly with our network of female ambassadors and have them create these massive user-generated content campaigns. Um, but but the way we package it has changed. So we move from being kind of, we no longer sell 10,000 package campaigns in, in three weeks. Um, it's really hard to get 10,000 people to do something all at once. I don't know if you guys know this, but it's, I would not recommend it. Um, so now basically the way we work with our clients, most of our clients um, do packages of about 100 ambassadors uh, posting each month about their brand. So it's more like a subscription. You know, you, you have your Facebook marketing, you have your AdWords, and you have your heartbeat. So we're kind of like this evergreen marketing service that, that people are working with more. So the actual output is the same, but it's just packaged in a different way. What I find interesting about... Um, well, actually, you know what? I'm going to table that one because it's just the idea of having real people pitch a product and an ambassador element. I mean, that is so much more powerful than a Kardashian or any type of celebrity posting about something because it's your friend. But we'll talk about it in a second. So funding. So um, you're in Techstars. Did funding happen post Techstars? And what is your current fund? Where, after what, three years you funded? How much have you raised? Yeah. Um, we've raised three, oh, just about $3 million to date. Awesome. Yeah. And you're still pitching right now, like as we speak. Yeah. So, <laughs> hi, everybody. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, we actually just have a tiny bit left on this round. Um, but yeah, so we we kind of had an... And I, I think we talked about this, but like when you read a book about startups, they're like, you have your angel round and then you have your seed round and then you have your series A round. And it never actually works out like that, right? Like it takes always a lot longer to raise money than you, than you think it's going to. And it's just always a little more murky. Um, and so we, so this, Heartbeat, actually, the company, the entity, was a pivot of my co-founder's last company. So that's the initial complication. Um, and he didn't want to, you know, screw over his investors, which was like the right thing to do. Um, and so that's how we started. So we had a little bit of money left that he had raised when, when we started. Um, and then we raised a little bit of money when, when I kind of, you know, joined the team and we, we made that decision. Um, and then we raised a little bit more and then we raised a little bit more. So we kind of kept ourselves going. Um, we've definitely been of the philosophy, like don't raise more money than you need. It's like a, weird phenomenon i think that people want to raise a hundred million dollars for a company that it, they haven't proven they can make money on because you guys have to like fix that <laughs> eventually right um so um we went to techstars techstars in- invests a little bit as well um and at the end of techstars we um we closed about another million dollars i think we're like at 1.2 on that now so that's awesome yeah that is awesome do you yeah. enjoy pitching i do i love it um but my co-founder Brian is doing most of the fundraising right now, and I'm okay. doing more of the operating. Um, okay. So one thing we have learned, and I think is something that everyone should take to heart, is you have to divide and conquer. It is not possible to do fundraising and kind of manage the day-to-day part of the business. It's just it's no one can make that happen. The um, so what I was saying earlier about the interesting space. I mean, really, you hear a lot about you know. Run a run a Facebook ad to test your theory to see if you're you know see if someone will buy your product see if someone I mean really heartbeat can be one of those as well I mean sure. if you wanted to test a product or an app or um, or anything you know having an ambassador right because that one post 
from me will probably get, well, nobody from, you know, someone else will probably get a few downloads because it's a personal engagement, right? Yep. Um, that's compelling from a, from a, a testing perspective because everyone keeps talking about Facebook ads because it is. I mean, I mean, that's the, you know, the 800 pound gorilla, but heartbeat is another one of those or can be it is and i mean we have 175,000 people in the network um and we're growing by 20,000 a month or something like that now um we're essentially a big focus group right so when i work for procter and gamble we spent millions of dollars on research on focus groups on sampling on testing on you know just we go in in home you know to people and, and and see if they liked our new our new paper towel um and so we can do all of those things, but we can do it basically in real time. Um, and what we've realized is, you know, our initial product is creating these massive content campaigns where people are posting on their Instagram, but we can be so much more. We have this, this network of real people who are really excited. Like they are really excited about discovering new products and they'll basically do it for free or for a free product or for $5. Um, and so we're able to, to do things like consumer research for, for our clients as well. Um, but yeah, it, it's interesting because if you think about kind of like the marketing mix, I don't know how many real, you know, mar- love marketing lovers there are in the world. But um, like you have your Facebook ads, you have your AdWords, you have all the ways that you test right now in digital marketing, and there's just not that many options. Um, so we can come in and, and kind of be that. Um, what's interesting, and another piece of this to me is that Facebook ads are kind of, you know, they're kind of a letdown. Facebook and Twitter, I don't know if you guys remember like in the early 2000s when Facebook and Twitter launched, they're like, brands can finally connect directly with their customers. Like you can finally talk to that person that like, you know, and and it ended up never really happening, right? Like the products that Facebook and Twitter created enabled you to do that, but not at scale. The way that they enabled you to do that at scale was through their ad platform. So Right now, it's brand, Facebook ad, consumer. What Heartbeat aspires to do is just go brand, consumer, consumer talking about that brand, right? So you're eliminating that middleman. Um, do you have metrics on that chatter beyond the post? Like, do you have real data that can go back and say, hey, brand, this was a post by, my, uh, by 100 ambassadors, but that reach was X? Yeah, we have numbers on kind of, you know, reach, but we also have like hard data numbers on ROI and on sales and on traffic. Um, And we've always approached the company that way. So we've built some really strong case studies around like, what can we actually do? Um, And so, yeah, so it's, it's starting to get really compelling. (laughs) Um, And, you know, some of our most recent campaigns have just generated incredible ROI. Um, You know, and even when I see it, since I know how far we come from the company, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, wow, I'm so excited um, because you know this hypothesis that these normal women could prove really valuable is is really coming true. Yeah, that's awesome. I appreciate how candid you've been tonight. So as we wrap up, you know, you're in the grind with many of us here. What is some advice you've been given that is just something you will not let go of because of how much how golden it is that you can share with us? My advice would be that there's no such thing as a bad meeting. Um, I make an effort to do like a coffee chat with somebody new at 7.30 in the morning at least once a week. Um, And I'm a natural networker. It comes really easy to me. I really enjoy meeting people. I'm like an extrovert in the, in the traditional sense of the, of that word. Um, but it's, and that's really hard for a lot of people. But I think if you prioritize setting up meetings with people, um, taking coffee chats where, where there's no real reason, I think we were talking about this earlier. Um, you know, those, those encounters are the ones that end up being clients or end up being investors. Like most of my investors are not people that like are traditionally introduced. Like one of my investors, I live next door to, my sophomore year in college. Um, one of my investors was like a friend of an ex I dated. And had I been mean to that ex, like that never would have happened, you know? So, so I think like, think of every person you meet as, as a positive encounter that could really, really help you. And, and you can really help them as well. I think that that's, that's the best advice I've ever been given. I love that. I absolutely love that. Startup Grand Community, let's hear it for Kate Edwards. 